may only the truth be spoken so that only the truth will be heard. Amen. Once upon a time, there was a woman who set out to discover the meaning of life. First, she decided to read everything she could get her hands on, history and philosophy and psychology and religion. While she became a very smart person, nothing she read gave her the answer that she was looking for. So she decided to find other smart people and ask them about the meaning of life. But even though their discussions were long and lively, no two of them agreed on the same thing. And she still had no answer. Finally, she put all her belongings in storage and set off in search of the meaning of life. She went to South America, she went to Africa, she went to India. Everywhere she went, people told her they didn't know the meaning of life, but they had heard of a man who did. Only they weren't sure where he lived. She asked about him in every country on earth until finally, deep in the Himalayas, Someone told her how to reach his house, a tiny little hut perched on the side of a mountain near the tree line. She climbed and climbed to reach the front door. When she finally got there with knuckles so cold she could hardly knock, she did, knocked on the door. Yes? said the kind-looking man who opened it. And she thought she would die of happiness. I've come halfway around the world to ask you one question, she said, gasping for breath. What is the meaning of life? Please come in and have some tea, the old man said. No, she said impatiently. I, I mean... No, thank you. I didn't come all this way for tea. I came for an answer. Won't you tell me, please, what is the meaning of life? We shall have tea, the old man said. So she gave up and came inside. While he was brewing the tea, she caught her breath and began telling him about all the books she had read, all the people she had met, all the places she had been. The old man listened, which was just as well, since his visitor didn't leave much room for him to reply anyway. And as she talked, he placed a fragile teacup in her hand. Then he began to pour the tea. She was so busy talking that she didn't notice when the teacup was full. So the old man just kept pouring until the tea ran over the sides of the cup and spilled to the floor in a steaming waterfall. What are you doing? She yelled when the tea burned her hand. It's full. Can't you see that? Stop. There's no more room. Just so, the old man said to her. You come here wanting something from me, but what am I to do? There's no more room in your cup. Come back when it's empty, and we will talk. How full is your cup? Is the fragile teacup of your life overflowing? Is there room for meaning for God? None of us is immune to the pressures of modern life. We run and run and run. A meeting here, an errand there, a schedule scattered all over. Work that piles up and needs to be taken care of, an inbox that demands our attention. 
except that pile never seems to go down. Those claims never go away. The inbox never stops demanding. A phone filled with texts and emails and notifications and alerts, and it's coming at us from all sides, from family and friends and community groups, co-workers and bosses, church members, and at all stages of life. Life with young children is a breathless life of constant motion. But even retired people will tell you with amazement that they've never been so busy. No doubt the tea is overflowing our cups. It's hard to make room for God. Hard, yes, but not impossible. For more than 20 centuries, the church has been thinking about this problem. This problem is nothing new. And it's been thinking about what we can do to get around it. We get a hint of the answer in today's readings based on the book of Acts. When the early church needed to make some room for God, they instinctively turned to fasting and prayer. And they were faced with a decision, and they wanted to make the right decision. They were trying to figure out whether they should let Paul and Barnabas loose on the world to spread the gospel and share the good news of God in Jesus Christ to set up new communities of faith. But before they could decide, they wanted to listen for God's direction. In order to seek God they needed to make room for God. So they prayed, and they fasted. And that's why we are focusing this morning on the idea of decluttering, of clearing up some space in our lives in order to make room for God. Fasting clearly means taking away food, or at least something vital to the enjoyment of life. Have you ever tried it? Because I try to follow the church here myself, I usually think about fasting during Lent. Maybe you've given up something during Lent as a fast too, a way to declutter in order to make room. Maybe something like coffee or chocolate or maybe something more drastic like TV or meat or cigarettes. Christians aren't the only ones, of course, who practice fasting. My neighbors are Muslim who observe Ramadan, the month-long fast from sunrise to sunset that shows up once every year. And I know lots of indigenous people who practice a four-day fast during a vision quest or a sun dance ceremony. Or maybe you've noticed how social media is all over intermittent fasting these days as a way to lose weight. Even Kim Kardashian is an advocate. And just on Friday at work, I spent probably 30 minutes listening to a staff member telling me about his experience with intermittent fasting. Lots of detail. More detail maybe than I needed. The goal there is more health related of course than spiritual but it certainly adds to the growing cultural buzz around fasting. And the whole point of fasting is the why. Why do we fast? It's not just to make us look pious. Jesus is clear about that in today's gospel reading. And it's not just a deprivation. Fasting should add something to our lives and not just take something away. It's meant to awaken us to life more than it's meant to deprive us of it. 
Fasting can sharpen the soul to the presence of God, to the truths and treasures that will last, as Jesus says. It empties us literally so that we have room for God. At the beginning of the summer, at our first uh, summer joint service at McKenzie United Church, you may have been there, I spoke about going through my old filing cabinet in the basement. It was kind of like walking down memory lane, and so I got a bit distracted. Well, actually, I, I got a lot distracted. But my goal was to do some decluttering, because there was a lot of material in that cabinet that I hadn't looked at in years, probably decades. My class notes from the 1980s were all there. Handouts from conferences I went to when I was in my early 30s were there. Old receipts from the days when you could buy a brand new hard-covered book for $6.95 were there too. If anything needed decluttering, that filing cabinet was it. And so I began the work of decluttering one evening a few months ago. It wasn't long, though, before I picked up a white envelope addressed to me by a friend from high school delivered about 40 years ago. I had to stop and take a look at it. Inside was a long letter. We were now in different universities, different parts of the country, and about four or five poems he had written. My friend was a fantastic writer, and poetry was his forte. He was even selected for a mentorship program with an actual published poet who would help him develop his craft and set him on the path to getting published himself. And here in my hands were a few of the poems he had written. And I was amazed. I had forgotten, I guess, how, how beautiful they were, how well they captured an image or a moment or a feeling. He understood so much in the words he had written. But it got me to wondering what had become of him after all of this time. And so I googled his name, and my search led me to Dawson College in Montreal, where his name appeared as an instructor in sociology. Now, I wasn't exactly sure it was him, there was no photo or anything, but it sounded like him, so I sent him an email, just on a whim. And it wasn't long before I got an email back. And sure enough, it was him. He was married with an adult son and now living and teaching in Montreal. But then he said to me that he was actually, at that moment, in Brandon, visiting his parents for a few weeks and wondered if we could get together. What were the chances of that? So we got together one Saturday afternoon in June in Brandon for a visit. Two kids from high school who hadn't seen one another for 40 years. I should say he looked way older than I'm sure I looked. <laughs> we reminisced and talked about our impressions of people we had known in school and uh, where certain people had ended up in their lives, all those usual things. We talked about ourselves and our growth and development over the years, how we had changed, how we had stayed the same. For me, for someone who didn't really like high school very much, it was surprisingly healing to go over those memories once again. It was like safely coming to terms with a part of myself, part of my past, that I often chose to ignore. And it all began with decluttering. 
I thought I was making room for more space in the basement. But when I look back at it, it seems to me that I was making room now for something more than that. That entire experience sharpened my soul to the presence of God. And I'm thankful that God used that opening, that space, that act of decluttering, of clearing out, to fill me with gratitude and connection and grace. The decluttering didn't just take something away. It added something to my life. Sometimes we need to feel the shock of hot water pouring over our hand. Sometimes we need to wake up and realize that our teacup is too full. Sometimes we need to empty that cup before we can receive the very thing we know we want or need the most. We need to make room for God. Fasting might help. Prayer might help. Quiet breathing might help. A walk on a warm fall afternoon might help. Talking to old friends might help. The point is to make room. And by doing so, we make space for God. Thanks be to God. Amen.